Operation Overlord was the code name for the Battle of Normandy, the Allied operation that launched the successful invasion of German-occupied Western Europe during World War II. The operation was launched on 6 June 1944 with the Normandy landings. A 1,200 plane airborne assault preceded an amphibious assault involving more than 5,000 vessels. Nearly 160,000 troops crossed the English Channel on 6 June, and more than 2 million Allied troops were in France by the end of August. The decision to undertake a cross-channel invasion in 1944 was taken at the Trident Conference in Washington in May 1943. General Dwight D. Eisenhower was appointed Commander of Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, and General Bernard Montgomery was named as Commander of the 21st Army Group, which comprised all the land forces involved in the invasion. The coast of Normandy of northwestern France was chosen as the site of the invasion, with the Americans assigned to land at sectors codenamed Utah and Omaha, the British at Sword and Gold, and the Canadians at Juneau. To meet the conditions expected on the Normandy beachhead, special technology was developed, including two artificial ports called Mulberry Harbors and an array of specialized tanks nicknamed Hobart's Funnies. In the months leading up to the invasion, the Allies conducted Operation Bodyguard, a substantial military deception that used electronic and visual misinformation to mislead the Germans as to the date and location of the main Allied landings. Führer Adolf Hitler placed German Field Marshal Erwin Rommel in charge of developing fortifications all along Hitler's proclaimed Atlantic Wall in anticipation of an invasion. The Allies failed to accomplish their objectives for the first day, but gained a tenuous foothold that they gradually expanded when they captured the port at Cherbourg on 26 June and the city of Caen on 21 July. A failed counter-attack by German forces on 8 August left 50,000 soldiers of the 7th Army trapped in the Falaise pocket. The Allies launched a second invasion from the Mediterranean Sea of southern France on 15 August, and the liberation of Paris followed on 25 August. German forces retreated east across the Seine on 30 August 1944, marking the close of Operation Overlord. Chapter 1 – Preparations for D-Day In June 1940, Germany's leader Adolf Hitler had triumphed in what he called the most famous victory in history the fall of France. British craft evacuated to England over 338,000 Allied troops trapped along the northern coast of France, in the Dunkirk evacuation. British planners reported to Prime Minister Winston Churchill on 4 October that even with the help of other Commonwealth countries and the United States, it would not be possible to regain a foothold in continental Europe in the near future. After the Axis invaded the Soviet Union in June 1941, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin began pressing for a second front in Western Europe. Churchill declined because he felt that even with American help the British did not have adequate forces for such a strike, and he wished to avoid costly frontal assaults such as those that had occurred at the Somme and Passchendaele in World War I. Two tentative plans codenamed Operation Roundup and Operation Sledgehammer were put forward for 1942-43, but neither was deemed by the British to be practical or likely to succeed. Instead, the Allies expanded their activity in the Mediterranean, launching the invasion of French North Africa in November 1942, the invasion of Sicily in July 1943, and invading Italy in September. These campaigns provided the troops with valuable experience in amphibious warfare. Those attending the Trident Conference in Washington in May 1943 took the decision to launch a cross channel invasion within the next year. Churchill favored making the main Allied thrust into Germany from the Mediterranean theater, but the Americans, who were providing the bulk of the men and equipment, overruled him. British Lieutenant General Frederick E. Morgan was appointed Chief of Staff, Supreme Allied Commander, to begin detailed planning. The initial plans were constrained by the number of available landing craft, most of which were already committed in the Mediterranean and in the Pacific in part because of lessons learned in the Dieppe raid of 19 August 1942, the Allies decided not to directly assault a heavily defended French seaport in their first landing. The failure at Dieppe also highlighted the need for adequate artillery and air support, 
particularly close air support, and specialized ships able to travel extremely close to shore. The short operating range of British aircraft such as the Spitfire and Typhoon greatly limited the number of potential landing sites, as comprehensive air support depended upon having planes overhead for as long as possible. Morgan considered four sites for the landings, Brittany, the Cotentin Peninsula, Normandy, and the Pas de Calais. As Brittany and Cotentin are peninsulas, the Germans could have cut off the Allied advance at a relatively narrow isthmus, so these sites were rejected. Pas de Calais, the closest point in continental Europe to Britain, was the location of launch sites for V-1 and V-2 rockets, then still under development. The Germans regarded it as the most likely initial landing zone and accordingly made it the most heavily fortified region, however, it offered the Allies few opportunities for expansion as the area is bounded by numerous rivers and canals. On the other hand, landings on a broad front in Normandy would permit simultaneous threats against the port of Cherbourg, coastal ports further west in Brittany, and an overland attack towards Paris and eventually into Germany. The Allies therefore chose Normandy as the landing site. The most serious drawback of the Normandy coast, the lack of port facilities, would be overcome through the development of artificial harbours. The Cossack staff planned to begin the invasion on 1 May 1944. The initial draft of the plan was accepted at the Quebec Conference in August 1943. General Dwight D. Eisenhower was appointed commander of Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. General Bernard Montgomery was named commander of the 21st Army Group, which comprised all of the land forces involved in the invasion. On 31 December 1943, Eisenhower and Montgomery first saw the Cossack Plan, which proposed amphibious landings by three divisions, with two more divisions in support. The two generals immediately insisted on expanding the scale of the initial invasion to five divisions, with airborne descents by three additional divisions, to allow operations on a wider front and to speed up the capture of the port at Cherbourg. This significant expansion required the acquisition of additional landing craft, which caused the invasion to be delayed by a month until June 1944. Eventually the Allies committed 39 divisions to the Battle of Normandy, 22 American, 12 British, 3 Canadian, 1 Polish, and 1 French, totaling over a million troops. Chapter 1 Section 1, Allied Invasion Plan Overlord was the name assigned to the establishment of a large-scale lodgment on the continent. The first phase, the amphibious invasion and establishment of a secure foothold, was codenamed Operation Neptune, and is often referred to as D-Day. To gain the required air superiority needed to ensure a successful invasion, the Allies launched a bombing campaign to target German aircraft production, fuel supplies, and airfields. Under the transport plan, communications infrastructure and road and rail links were bombed to cut off the north of France and to make it more difficult to bring up reinforcements. These attacks were widespread so as to avoid revealing the exact location of the invasion. Elaborate deceptions were planned to prevent the Germans from determining the timing and location of the invasion. The coastline of Normandy was divided into 17 sectors, with codenames using a spelling alphabet, from Abel, west of Omaha, to Roger on the east flank of Sword. Eight further sectors were added when the invasion was extended to include Utah on the Cotentin Peninsula. Sectors were further subdivided into beaches identified by the colors green, red, and white dot allied planners envisaged preceding the seaborne landings with airborne drops, near Khan on the eastern flank to secure the Orne River bridges, and north of Caronton on the western flank. The initial goal was to capture Caronton, Isigny, Bayou, and Khan. The Americans, assigned to land at Utah and Omaha, were to cut off the Cotentin Peninsula and capture the port facilities at Cherbourg. The British at Sword and Gold, and the Canadians at Juneau, were to capture Caen and form a front line from Cormont Levente to the southeast of Caen in order to protect the American flank, while establishing airfields near Caen. Possession of Caen and in its surroundings would give the Anglo Canadian forces a suitable staging area for a push south to capture the town of Falaise. 
a secure lodgment would be established and an attempt made to hold all territory captured north of the Avranches Falaise line during the first three weeks. The Allied armies would then swing left to advance towards the river Seine. The invasion fleet, led by Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey, was split into the Western Naval Task Force supporting the American sectors and the Eastern Naval Task Force in the British and Canadian sectors. The American forces of the First Army, led by Lieutenant General Omar Bradley, comprised seven corps and V Corps. On the British side, Lieutenant General Miles Dempsey commanded the Second Army, under which 30 corps was assigned to Gold and I Corps to Juno and Sword. Land forces were under the overall command of Montgomery, and Air Command was assigned to Air Chief Marshal Sir Trafford Lee Mallory. The 1st Canadian Army included personnel and units from Poland, Belgium, and the Netherlands. Other Allied nations also participated. Chapter 1 Section 2 Reconnaissance the Allied Expeditionary Air Force undertook over 3,200 photo reconnaissance sorties from April 1944 until the start of the invasion. Photos of the coastline were taken at extremely low altitude to show the invaders the terrain, obstacles on the beach, and defensive structures such as bunkers and gun emplacements. To avoid alerting the Germans as to the location of the invasion, this work had to be undertaken over the entire European coastline. Inland terrain, bridges, troop emplacements, and buildings were also photographed in many cases from several angles, to give the Allies as much information as possible. Members of Combined Operations Pilotage Parties clandestinely prepared detailed harbour maps, including depth soundings. An appeal for holiday pictures and postcards of Europe announced on the BBC produced over 10 million items, some of which proved useful. Information collected by the French resistance helped provide details on Axis troop movements and on construction techniques used by the Germans for bunkers and other defensive installations. Many German radio messages were encoded using the Enigma machine, and other enciphering techniques and the codes were changed frequently. A team of code breakers stationed at Bletchley Park worked to break codes as quickly as possible to provide advance information on German plans and troop movements. British military intelligence code named this information ultra-intelligence as it could only be provided to the top level of commanders. The Enigma code used by Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt, a Berberfeldscheber West, commander of the Western Front, was broken by the end of March. German intelligence changed the Enigma codes right after the Allied landings of the 6th of June but by the 17th of June the Allies were again consistently able to read them. Chapter 1 Section 3 Technology In response to the lessons learned at the disastrous Dieppe raid, the Allies developed new technologies to help ensure the success of Overlord. To supplement the preliminary offshore bombardment and aerial assaults, some of the landing craft were equipped with artillery and anti-tank guns to provide close supporting fire. The Allies had decided not to immediately attack any of the heavily protected French ports and two artificial ports, called Mulberry Harbors, were designed by Cossack planners. Each assembly consisted of a floating outer breakwater, inner concrete caissons and several floating piers. The Mulberry Harbors were supplemented by blockship shelters. With the expectation that fuel would be difficult or impossible to obtain on the continent, the Allies built a pipeline under the ocean. Specially developed pipes three inches in diameter were to be laid under the channel from the Isle of Wight to Cherbourg, by D-Day plus 18. Technical problems and the delay in capturing Cherbourg, meant the pipeline, was not operational until 22 September. A second line was laid from Dungeness to Boulogne in late October. The British military built a series of specialized tanks, nicknamed Hobart's Funnies, to deal with conditions expected during the Normandy campaign. Developed under the supervision of Major General Percy Hobart, these were specially modified M4 Sherman and Churchill tanks. Examples include the Sherman Crab Tank, the Churchill Crocodile, and the Armoured Ramp Carrier, which other tanks could use as a bridge to scale sea walls or to overcome other obstacles. In some areas, the beaches consisted of a soft clay that could not support the weight of tanks. 
The bobbin tank would overcome this problem by deploying a roll of matting over the soft surface and leaving the material in place as a route for more conventional tanks. The armored vehicle Royal Engineers were modified for many tasks, including laying bridges and firing large charges into pillboxes. The duplex drive tank, another design developed by Hobart's group, was a self-propelled amphibious tank kept afloat using a waterproof canvas screen inflated with compressed air. These tanks were easily swamped, and on D-Day, many sank before reaching the shore, especially at Omaha. Chapter 1 Section 4 – Deception In the months leading up to the invasion, the Allies conducted Operation Bodyguard, the overall strategy designed to mislead the Germans as to the date and location of the main Allied landings. Operation Fortitude included Fortitude North, a misinformation campaign using fake radio traffic to lead the Germans into expecting an attack on Norway, and Fortitude South, a major deception designed to fool the Germans into believing that the landings would take place at Par de Calais in July. A fictitious 1st U.S. Army group was invented, supposedly located in Kent and Sussex under the command of Lieutenant General George S. Patton. The Allies constructed dummy tanks, trucks, and landing craft, and positioned them near the coast. Several military units, including 2 Canadian Corps and 2nd Canadian Division, moved into the area to bolster the illusion that a large force was gathering there. As well as the broadcast of fake radio traffic, genuine radio messages from 21st Army Group were first routed to Kent via landline and then broadcast, to give the Germans the impression that most of the Allied troops were stationed there. Patton remained stationed in England until 6 July, thus continuing to deceive the Germans into believing a second attack would take place at Calais. Military and civilian personnel alike were aware of the need for secrecy, and the invasion troops were as much as possible kept isolated, especially in the period immediately before the invasion. One American general was sent back to the United States in disgrace after revealing the invasion date at a party. The Germans thought they had an extensive network of spies operating in the UK, but in fact, all their agents had been captured, and some had become double agents working for the Allies as part of the double cross system. The double agent Juan Puyol Garcia, a Spanish opponent of the Nazis known by the code name Garbo, developed over the two years leading up to D-Day a fake network of informants that the Germans believed were collecting intelligence on their behalf. In the months preceding D-Day, Puyol sent hundreds of messages to his superiors in Madrid, messages specially prepared by the British Intelligence Service to convince the Germans that the attack would come in July at Calais. Many of the German radar stations on the French coast were destroyed by the RAF in preparation for the landings. On the night before the invasion, in Operation Taxable, 617 squadron dropped strips of window, metal foil that German radar operators interpreted as a naval convoy approaching Cap d'Antifa. The illusion was bolstered by a group of small vessels towing barrage balloons. Number 218 Squadron RAF also dropped window near boulogne sur mer in Operation Glimmer. On the same night, a small group of special air service operators deployed dummy paratroopers over Le Havre and Isigny. These dummies led the Germans to believe an additional airborne assault had occurred. Chapter 1 Section 5 – Rehearsals and Security Training exercises for the Overlord landings took place as early as July 1943. As the nearby beach resembled the planned Normandy landing site, the town of Slapton in Devon, was evacuated in December 1943, and taken over by the armed forces as a site for training exercises that included the use of landing craft and the management of beach obstacles. A friendly fire incident there on 27 April 1944 resulted in as many as 450 deaths. The following day, an additional estimated 749 American soldiers and sailors died when German torpedo boats surprised members of Assault Force U conducting Exercise Tiger. Exercises with landing craft and live ammunition also took place at the Combined Training Center in Inverary in Scotland. Naval exercises took place in Northern Ireland, and medical teams in London, and elsewhere rehearsed how they would handle the expected waves of casualties. Paratroopers conducted exercises, 
including a huge demonstration drop on 23 March 1944 observed by Churchill, Eisenhower, and other top officials. Allied planners considered tactical surprise to be a necessary element of the plan for the landings. Information on the exact date and location of the landings was provided only to the topmost levels of the armed forces. Men were sealed into their marshalling areas at the end of May, with no further communication with the outside world. Troops were briefed using maps that were correct in every detail except for the place names, and most were not told their actual destination until they were already at sea. A news blackout in Britain increased the effectiveness of the deception operations. Travel to and from the Republic of Ireland was banned, and movement within several kilometres of the coast of England restricted. Chapter 1 Section 6 Weather Forecasting The invasion planners specified a set of conditions regarding the timing of the invasion, deeming only a few days in each month suitable. A full moon was desirable, as it would provide illumination for aircraft pilots and have the highest tides. The Allies wanted to schedule the landings for shortly before dawn, midway between low and high tide, with the tide coming in. This would improve the visibility of obstacles the enemy had placed on the beach while minimizing the amount of time the men had to spend exposed in the open. Specific criteria were also set for wind speed, visibility, and cloud cover. Eisenhower had tentatively selected the 5th of June as the date for the assault, however, on the 4th of June, conditions were clearly unsuitable for a landing, high winds and heavy seas made it impossible to launch landing craft, and low clouds would prevent aircraft from finding their targets. By the evening of the 4th of June, the Allied meteorological team, headed by Group Captain James Stagg of the Royal Air Force, predicted that the weather would improve sufficiently so that the invasion could go ahead on the 6th of June. He met Eisenhower and other senior commanders at their headquarters at Southwick House in Hampshire to discuss the situation. General Montgomery and Major General Walter Bedell Smith, Eisenhower's chief of staff, were eager to launch the invasion. Admiral Bertram Ramsey was prepared to commit his ships, while Air Chief Marshal Trafford Lee Mallory expressed concern that the conditions would be unfavorable for Allied aircraft. After much discussion, Eisenhower decided that the invasion should go ahead. Allied control of the Atlantic meant that German meteorologists did not have access to as much information as the Allies on incoming weather patterns. As the Luftwaffe Meteorological Center in Paris predicted two weeks of stormy weather, Many Wehrmacht commanders left their posts to attend war games in Rennes, and men in many units were given leave. Marshal Erwin Rommel returned to Germany for his wife's birthday and to meet Hitler to try to get more panzers. Had Eisenhower postponed the invasion, the next available period with the right combination of tides was two weeks later, from 18 to 20 June. As it happened, during this period the invaders would have encountered a major storm lasting four days, between 19 and 22 June, that would have made the initial landings impossible. Chapter 1 Section 7 – German Preparations and Defenses Nazi Germany had at its disposal 50 divisions in France and the Low Countries, with another 18 stationed in Denmark and Norway. Fifteen divisions were in the process of formation in Germany, but there was no strategic reserve. The Calais region was defended by the 15th Army under General Oberst Hans von Salmut, and Normandy by the 7th Army commanded by General Oberst Friedrich Dahlmann. Combat losses throughout the war, particularly on the Eastern Front, meant the Germans no longer had a pool of able young men from which to draw. German soldiers were now on average six years older than their Allied counterparts. Many in the Normandy area were Oslegenen conscripts and volunteers from Turkestan, Russia, Mongolia, and elsewhere. The Wehrmacht had provided them mainly with unreliable captured equipment, they lacked motorized transport. Formations that arrived later, such as the 12th SS Panzer Division Hitlerjugend, were, for the most part, younger and far better equipped and trained than the static troops, stationed along the coast. In early 1944, Ob West was significantly weakened by personnel and materiel transfers to the Eastern Front. During the Soviet Dnieper Carpathian Offensive, 
the German high command was forced to transfer the entire two SS Panzer Corps from France, consisting of the 9th and 10th SS Panzer Divisions, as well as the 349th Infantry Division, 507th Heavy Panzer Battalion and the 311th and 322nd Schug Assault Gun Brigades. All told, the German forces stationed in France were deprived of 45,827 troops and 363 tanks, assault guns, and self-propelled anti-tank guns. It was the first major transfer of forces from France to the East since the creation of Führer Directive 51, which no longer allowed any transfers from the West to the East. There were also transfers to the Italian front, von Rundstedt complained that many of his best units had been sent on a fool's errand to Italy, saying it was madness, that frightful boot of a country should have been evacuated, we should have held a decent front with a few divisions on the Alpine frontier. The 1st SS Panzer Division Lebstandarte SS Adolf Hitler, 9th, 11th, 19th and 116th Panzer Divisions, alongside the 2nd SS Panzer Division Das Reich, had only arrived in March to May 1944 to France for extensive refit after being badly damaged during Dnieper Carpathian operation. Seven of the eleven Panzer or Panzergrenadier divisions stationed in France were still not fully operational or only partially mobile in early June 1944. Chapter 1 Section 7 Subsection 2 Atlantic Wall Alarmed by the raids on Saint-Nazaire and Dieppe in 1942, Hitler ordered the construction of fortifications all along the Atlantic coast, from Spain to Norway, to protect against an expected Allied invasion. He envisioned 15,000 emplacements manned by 300,000 troops, but due to shortages, particularly of concrete and manpower, most of the strongpoints were never built. As the expected site of an Allied invasion, Par de Calais was heavily defended. In the Normandy area the best fortifications were concentrated at the port facilities at Cherbourg and St. Malo. A report by Rundstedt to Hitler in October 1943 regarding the weak defences in France led to the appointment of Rommel to oversee the construction of further fortifications along the expected invasion front, which stretched from the Netherlands to Cherbourg. Rommel was given command of the newly reformed Army Group B, which included the 7th Army, the 15th Army, and the forces guarding the Netherlands. Nazi Germany's tangled command structure made it difficult for Rommel to achieve his task. He was not allowed to give orders to the organization Todd, which was commanded by armaments minister Albert Speer, so in some places he had to assign soldiers to do construction work. Rommel believed that the Normandy coast could be a possible landing point for the invasion, so he ordered the construction of extensive defensive works along that shore. In addition to concrete gun emplacements at strategic points along the coast, he ordered wooden stakes, metal tripods, mines, and large anti-tank obstacles to be placed on the beach to delay the approach of landing craft and to impede the movement of tanks. Expecting the Allies to land at high tide so that the infantry would spend less time exposed on the beach, he ordered many of these obstacles to be placed at the high tide mark. Tangles of barbed wire, booby traps, and the removal of ground cover made the approach hazardous for infantry. On Rommel's order, the number of mines along the coast was tripled. Given the Allied air supremacy, booby-trapped stakes known as Rommelspargel were set up in meadows and fields to deter airborne landings. Chapter 1 Section 7 Subsection 3 Mobile Reserves Rommel, believing that the Germans' best chance was to stop the invasion of the shore, requested that mobile reserves, especially tanks, be stationed as close to the coast as possible. Rundstedt, General Leo Geyer von Schreppenberg, and other senior commanders believed that the invasion could not be stopped on the beaches. Geyer argued for a conventional doctrine, keeping the panzer formations concentrated in a central position around Paris and Rouen, and deploying them only when the main allied beachhead had been identified. Guy also noted that in the Italian campaign the armor stationed near the coast had been damaged by naval bombardment. Rommel's opinion was that because of the overwhelming Allied air superiority, large-scale movement of tanks would not be possible once the invasion was underway. Hitler made the final decision, 
he left three divisions under Gaius' command and gave Rommel operational control of three tank divisions as reserves. Hitler took personal control of four divisions as strategic reserves, not to be used without his direct orders. Chapter 2 – Invasion You are about to embark upon the Great Crusade, toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers-in-arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. By May 1944, 1.5 million American troops had arrived in the United Kingdom. Most were housed in temporary camps in the southwest of England, ready to move across the channel to the western section of the landing zone. British and Canadian troops were billeted in accommodation further east, spread from Southampton to New Haven, and even on the east coast for men who would be coming across in later waves. A complex system called movement control assured that the men and vehicles left on schedule from 20 departure points. Some men had to board their craft nearly a week before departure. The ships met at a rendezvous point southeast of the Isle of Wight to assemble into convoys to cross the channel. Minesweepers began clearing lanes on the evening of 5 June, and a thousand bombers left before dawn to attack the coastal defences. Some 1,200 aircraft departed England just before midnight to transport three airborne divisions to their drop zones behind enemy lines several hours before the beach landings. The American 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions were assigned objectives on the Cotentin Peninsula west of Utah. The British 6th Airborne Division was assigned to capture intact the bridges over the Khan Canal and River Orne. The Free French 4th SAS Battalion of 538 men, was assigned objectives in Brittany. Some 132,000 men were transported by sea on D-Day, and a further 24,000 came by air. Preliminary naval bombardment commenced at 5.45 and continued until 6.25 from five battleships, 20 cruisers, 65 destroyers, and two monitors. Infantry began arriving on the beaches at around 6.30. Chapter 2 Section 1 – Beaches the craft bearing the U.S. 4th Infantry Division assaulting Utah were pushed by the current to a spot about 1,800 meters south of their intended landing zone. The troops met light resistance, suffering fewer than 200 casualties. Their efforts to push inland fell far short of their targets for the first day, but they were able to advance about four miles, making contact with the 101st Airborne Division. The airborne landings west of Utah were not very successful, as only 10% of the paratroopers landed in their drop zones. Gathering the men together into fighting units was made difficult by a shortage of radios and by the terrain, with its hedgerows, stone walls and marshes. The 82nd Airborne Division captured its primary objective at St. Mir Iglese and worked to protect the western flank. Its failure to capture the river crossings at the river murder it resulted in a delay in sealing off the Cotentin Peninsula. The 101st Airborne Division helped protect the southern flank and captured the lock on the river Douve at La Barquette, but did not capture the assigned nearby bridges on the first day. At Point du Hoc, the task for the 200 men of the 2nd Ranger Battalion, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel James Rudder, was to scale the 30 meters cliffs with ropes and ladders to destroy the gun battery located there. While under fire from above, the men scaled the cliff, only to discover that the guns had already been withdrawn. The rangers located the weapons, unguarded but ready to use, in an orchard some 550 meters south of the point, and disabled them. Under attack, the men at the point became isolated, and some were captured. By dawn on D plus one, Rudder had only 90 men able to fight. Relief did not come until D plus two, when members of the 743rd Tank Battalion arrived. Omaha, the most heavily defended sector, was assigned to the U.S. 1st Infantry Division, supplemented by troops from the U.S. 29th Infantry Division. 
they faced the 352nd Infantry Division, rather than the expected single regiment. Strong currents forced many landing craft east of their intended position or delayed them. Casualties were heavier than all the other landings combined, as the men were subjected to fire from the cliffs above. Problems clearing the beach of obstructions led to the beachmaster calling a halt to further landings of vehicles at 8.30. A group of destroyers arrived around this time to offer supporting artillery fire. Exit from Omaha was possible only via five gullies, and by late morning barely 600 men had reached the higher ground. By noon, as the artillery fire took its toll and the Germans started to run out of ammunition, the Americans were able to clear some lanes on the beaches. They also started clearing the drawers of enemy defenses, so that vehicles could move off the beach. The tenuous beachhead was expanded over the following days, and the D-Day objectives were accomplished by D plus 3. At Gold, high winds made conditions difficult for the landing craft, and the amphibious DD tanks were landed close to shore or directly on the beach instead of further out as planned. Aerial attacks had failed to hit the La Hamel strongpoint, and its 75mm gun continued to do damage until 1600 hours. On the western flank, the 1st Battalion, Hampshire Regiment captured Aramanche, and contact was made on the eastern flank with the Canadian forces at Juneau. Landings of infantry at Juneau were delayed because of rough seas and the men arrived ahead of their supporting armor, suffering many casualties while disembarking. Most of the offshore bombardment had missed the German defenses. In spite of these difficulties, the Canadians quickly cleared the beach and created two exits to the villages above. Delays in taking Benny Mare led to congestion on the beach, but by nightfall, the contiguous Juno and Gold beachheads covered an area 12 miles wide and 7 miles deep. Casualties at Juno were 961 men. On sword, 21 of 25 DD tanks succeeded in getting safely ashore to provide cover for the infantry, who began disembarking at 7.30. They quickly cleared the beach and created several exits for the tanks. In the windy conditions, the tide came in more quickly than expected, making maneuvering the armor difficult. The 2nd Battalion, King's Shropshire Light Infantry advanced on foot to within a few kilometers of Khan, but had to withdraw due to lack of armor support. At 1600 hours, the German 21st Panzer Division mounted a counterattack between Sword and Juno and nearly succeeded in reaching the coast. They met stiff resistance from the British 3rd Infantry Division and were soon recalled to assist in the area between Khan and Bayou. The first components of the Mulberry Harbors were brought across on D plus 1, and the structures were in use for unloading by mid-June. One was constructed at Aramanche by the British, the other at Omaha by the Americans. Severe storms on 19 June interrupted the landing of supplies and destroyed the Omaha Harbor. The repaired Aramanche Harbor was able to receive around 6,000 tons of materiel daily and was in continuous use for the next 10 months but most shipments were brought in over the beaches until the port of Cherbourg, was cleared of mines and obstructions on 16 July. Allied casualties on the first day were at least 10,000, with 4,414 confirmed dead. The Germans lost 1,000 men. The Allied invasion plans had called for the capture of Caronton, saint Lo, Khan, and Bayou on the first day, with all the beaches, Linked with the front line 10 to 16 kilometers from the beaches, none of these objectives were achieved. The five bridgeheads were not connected until 12 June, by which time the Allies held a front around 97 kilometers long and 24 kilometers deep. Khan, a major objective, was still in German hands at the end of D-Day, and would not be completely captured until 21 July. Nearly 160,000 troops crossed the English Channel on 6 June, and more than 2 million Allied troops were in France by the end of August. Chapter 2 Section 2, Cherbourg In the western part of the lodgment, U.S. troops were to occupy the Cotentin Peninsula, especially Cherbourg, which would provide the Allies with a deep-water harbor. The terrain behind Utah, and Omaha was characterized by Bocage, with thorny hedgerows on embankments three to four feet high with a ditch on either side. 
Many areas were additionally protected by rifle pits, and machine gun emplacements. Most of the roads were too narrow for tanks. The Germans had flooded the fields behind Utah with sea water for up to two miles from the coast. German forces on the peninsula included the 91st Infantry Division, and the 243rd and 709th Static Infantry Divisions. By D plus 3 the Allied commanders realized that Cherbourg would not quickly be taken, and decided to cut off the peninsula to prevent any further reinforcements from being brought in. After failed attempts by the inexperienced 90th Infantry Division, Major General J. Lawton Collins, the 7th Corps commander, assigned the veteran 9th Infantry Division to the task. They reached the west coast of the Cotentin on 17 June, cutting off Cherbourg. The 9th Division, joined by the 4th and 79th Infantry Divisions, took control of the peninsula in fierce fighting from 19 June, Cherbourg, was captured on 26 June. By this time, the Germans had destroyed the port facilities, which were not brought back into full operation until September. Chapter 2 Section 3, Khan Fighting in the Khan area versus the 21st Panzer, the 12th SS Panzer Division Hitlerjugend and other units soon reached a stalemate. During Operation Perch, 30 corps attempted to advance south towards Mont Pincon but soon abandoned the direct approach in favor of a pincer attack to encircle Khan. 30 corps made a flanking move from tilly sur sules towards villers Bocage with part of the 7th Armored Division, while I corps tried to pass Khan to the east. The attack by I corps was quickly halted and 30 corps briefly captured villers Bocage. Advanced elements of the British force were ambushed, initiating a day-long battle of villers Bocage and then the Battle of the Box. The British were forced to withdraw to tilly sur sules after a delay because of storms from 17 to 23 June, Operation Epsom began on 26 June, an attempt by 8 Corps to swing around and attack Khan from the southwest and establish a bridgehead south of the Odon. Although the operation failed to take Khan, the Germans suffered many tank losses after committing every available panzer unit to the operation. Rundstedt was dismissed on 1 July and replaced as Ob West by Field Marshal Gunther von Kludge after remarking that the war was now lost. The northern suburbs of Khan were bombed on the evening of 7 July and then occupied north of the River Orne in Operation Charnwood on 8-9 July. Operation Atlantic and Operation Goodwood captured the rest of Khan and the high ground to the south from 18-21 July, by when the city was nearly destroyed. Hitler survived an assassination attempt on 20 July. Chapter 2 Section 4, Breakout from the Beachhead After securing territory in the Cotentin Peninsula south as far as Sonlo, the U.S. First Army launched Operation Cobra on 25 July and advanced further south to Avranches by 1 August. The British launched Operation Blue Coat on 30 July to secure Via and the high ground of Mont Pincon. Lieutenant General Patton's U.S. Third Army, activated on 1 August, quickly took most of Brittany and territory as far south as the Loire, while the First Army maintained pressure eastward toward Le Mans to protect their flank. By 3 August, Patton and the Third Army were able to leave a small force in Brittany and drive eastward towards the main concentration of German forces south of Caen. Over Kludge's objections, on 4 August Hitler ordered a counter-offensive from Via towards Avranches. While two Canadian corps pushed south from Caen toward Falaise in Operation Totalize on 8 August, Bradley and Montgomery realized that there was an opportunity for the bulk of the German forces to be trapped at Falaise. The Third Army continued the encirclement from the south, reaching Alencon on of August. Although Hitler continued to insist until 14 August that his forces should counterattack, Kludge and his officers began planning a retreat eastward. The German forces were severely hampered by Hitler's insistence on making all major decisions himself, which left his forces without orders for periods as long as 24 hours while information was sent back and forth to the Führer's residence at Obersaltsberg in Bavaria. On the evening of 12 August, 
Patton asked Bradley if his forces should continue northward to close the gap and encircle the German forces. Bradley refused because Montgomery had already assigned the 1st Canadian Army to take the territory from the north. The Canadians met heavy resistance and captured Falaise on 16 August. The gap was closed on 21 August, trapping 50,000 German troops but more than a third of the German 7th Army, and the remnants of nine of the 11 panzer divisions had escaped to the east. Montgomery's decision-making regarding the Falaise Gap was criticized at the time by American commanders, especially Patton, although Bradley was more sympathetic, and believed Patton would not have been able to close the gap. The issue has been the subject of much discussion among historians, criticism being leveled at American, British and Canadian forces. Hitler relieved Kludge of his command of Ob West on 15 August and replaced him with Field Marshal Walter Model. Kludge committed suicide on 19 August after Hitler became aware of his involvement in the 20th of July plot. An invasion in southern France was launched on 15 August. The French resistance in Paris rose against the Germans on 19 August. Eisenhower initially wanted to bypass the city to pursue other targets, but amid reports that the citizens were going hungry and Hitler's stated intention to destroy it, de Gaulle insisted that it should be taken immediately. French forces of the 2nd Armoured Division under General Philippe Leclerc arrived from the west on 24 August, while the US 4th Infantry Division pressed up from the south. Scattered fighting continued throughout the night, and by the morning of 25 August Paris was liberated. Operations continued in the British and Canadian sectors until the end of the month. On 25 August, the US 2nd Armoured Division fought its way into El Bouf, making contact with British and Canadian armoured divisions. The 2nd Canadian Infantry Division advanced into the Forêt de la Lande on the morning of 27 August. The area was strongly held, the 4th and 6th Canadian Brigades suffered many casualties over the course of three days as the Germans fought a delaying action in terrain well suited to defence. The Germans pulled back on 29 August, withdrawing over the Seine the next day. On the afternoon of 30 August, the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division crossed the Seine near Elbeuf and entered Rouen to a jubilant welcome. Chapter 3, Campaign Close Eisenhower took direct command of all Allied ground forces on 1 September. Concerned about German counterattacks and the limited materiel arriving in France, he decided to continue operations on a broad front rather than attempting narrow thrusts. The link-up of the Normandy forces with the Allied forces in southern France occurred on 12 September as part of the drive to the Siegfried Line. On 17 September, Montgomery launched Operation Market Garden, an unsuccessful attempt by Anglo-American airborne troops to capture bridges in the Netherlands to allow ground forces to cross the Rhine into Germany. The Allied advance slowed due to German resistance and the lack of supplies. On 16 December the Germans launched the Ardennes Offensive, also known as the Battle of the Bulge, their last major offensive of the war on the Western Front. A series of successful Soviet actions began with the Vistula Oda Offensive on 12 January. Hitler committed suicide on 30 April as Soviet troops neared his Führer bunker in Berlin, and Germany surrendered on 7 May 1945. The Normandy landings were the largest seaborne invasion in history, with nearly 5,000 landing and assault craft, 289 escort vessels, and 277 minesweepers. The opening of another front in Western Europe, was a tremendous psychological blow for Germany's military, who feared a repetition of the two-front war of World War I. The Normandy landings also heralded the start of the race for Europe between the Soviet forces and the Western powers which some historians consider to be the start of the Cold War. Victory in Normandy stemmed from several factors. German preparations along the Atlantic Wall were only partially finished, shortly before Didier Rommel reported that construction was only 18% complete in some areas as resources were diverted elsewhere. The deceptions undertaken in Operation Fortitude were successful, leaving the Germans obliged to defend a huge stretch of coastline. 
The Allies achieved and maintained air superiority, which meant that the Germans were unable to make observations of the preparations underway in Britain and were unable to interfere via bomber attacks. Transport infrastructure in France was severely disrupted by Allied bombers and the French resistance, making it difficult for the Germans to bring up reinforcements and supplies. Much of the opening artillery barrage was off target or not concentrated enough to have any impact, but the specialized armor worked well except on Omaha, providing close artillery support for the troops as they disembarked onto the beaches. The indecisiveness and overly complicated command structure of the German High Command was also a factor in the Allied success. Chapter 4 Casualties Chapter 4 Section 1 Allies From D Day to 21 August, the Allies landed 2,052,299 men in northern France. The cost of the Normandy campaign was high for both sides. Between 6 June and the end of August, the American armies suffered 124,394 casualties, of whom 20,668 were killed. The American armies suffered 10,128 soldiers missing. Casualties within the 1st Canadian and 2nd British armies are placed at 83,045, 15,995 killed. 57,996 wounded, and 9,054 missing. Of these, Canadian losses amounted to 18,444, with 5,021 killed in action. The Allied Air Forces, having flown 480,317 sorties in support of the invasion, lost 4,101 aircraft and 16,714 airmen. The free French SAS paratroopers suffered 77 killed, with 197 wounded and missing. Allied tank losses have been estimated at around 4,000, with losses split evenly between the American and British-slash-Canadian armies. Historians slightly differ on overall casualties during the campaign, with the lowest losses totaling 225,606 and the highest at 226,386. Chapter 4 Section 2 – Germany German forces in France reported losses of 158,930 men between D-Day and 14 August, just before the start of Operation Dragoon in southern France. In action at the Falaise Pocket, 50,000 men were lost, of whom 10,000 were killed and 40,000 captured. Sources vary on the total German casualties. Nicholas Zetterling, on examining German records, places the total German casualties suffered in Normandy in facing the Dragoon landings to be 288,695. Other sources arrive at higher estimates, 400,000, 500,000, to 530,000 in total. There are no exact figures regarding German tank losses in Normandy. Approximately 2,300 tanks and assault guns were committed to the battle, of which only 100 to 120 crossed the Seine at the end of the campaign. While German forces reported only 481 tanks destroyed between D Day and 31 July, Research conducted by No. 2 Operational Research Section of 21st Army Group indicates that the Allies destroyed around 550 tanks in June and July and another 500 in August, for a total of 1,050 tanks destroyed, including 100 destroyed by aircraft. Luftwaffe losses amounted to 2,127 aircraft. By the end of the Normandy campaign, 55 German divisions had been rendered combat ineffective, seven of these were disbanded. By September, Ob West had only 13 infantry divisions, three panzer divisions, and two panzer brigades rated as combat effective. Chapter 4 Section 3 – Civilians and French Heritage Buildings During the liberation of Normandy, between 13,632 and 19,890 French civilians were killed, and more were seriously wounded. In addition to those who died during the campaign, 11,000 to 19,000 Normans are estimated to have been killed, during pre-invasion bombing. 
A total of 70,000 French civilians were killed throughout the course of the war. Landmines and unexploded ordnance continued to inflict casualties upon the Norman population following the end of the campaign. Prior to the invasion, Schaeff issued instructions emphasizing the need to limit the destruction to French heritage sites. These sites, named in the official civil affairs lists of monuments, were not to be used by troops unless permission was received from the upper echelons of the chain of command. Nevertheless, church spires and other stone buildings throughout the area were damaged or destroyed to prevent them being used by the Germans. Efforts were made to prevent reconstruction workers from using rubble from important ruins to repair roads, and to search for artifacts. The Bayou Tapestry, and other important cultural treasures had been stored at the Chateau de Sauches near Le Mans from the start of the war, and survived intact. The occupying German forces also kept a list of protected buildings, but their intent was to keep the facilities in good condition for use as accommodation by German troops. Many cities and towns in Normandy were totally devastated by the fighting and bombings. By the end of the Battle of Caen, there remained only 8,000 livable quarters for a population of over 60,000. Of the 18 listed churches in Caen, four were seriously damaged and five were destroyed along with 66 other listed monuments. In the Calvados department, 76,000 citizens were rendered homeless. Of Khan's 210 pre-war Jewish population, only one survived the war. Looting was a concern, with all sides taking part, the retreating Germans, the invading Allies, and the local French population taking advantage of the chaos. Looting was never condoned by Allied forces, and any perpetrators who were found to be looting were punished. Chapter 5, War Memorials and Tourism The beaches of Normandy are still known by their invasion code names. Significant places have plaques, memorials, or small museums, and guide books and maps are available. Some of the German strong points remain preserved, Point du Hoc, in particular, is little changed from 1944. The remains of Mulberry Harbour B still sits in the sea at Aramanche. Several large cemeteries in the area serve as the final resting place for many of the Allied and German soldiers killed in the Normandy campaign. Above the English Channel on a bluff at Omaha Beach, the Normandy American Cemetery and Memorial has hosted numerous visitors each year. The site covers 172.5 acres and contains the remains of 9,388 American military dead, most of whom were killed during the invasion of Normandy and ensuing military operations in World War II. Included are graves of Army Air Corps crews shot down over France as early as 1942 and four American women. Chapter 5 Section 1 Explanatory Notes